careful what you say. ¿De dónde vienes? Yo, bueno, estoy sacando la maestría en aquí en American University. Muy pero bien. estoy trabajando en un proyecto de consultoría sí. con el ICA. Ah, con ICA. Sí, uh -huh. y quería hacer una pregunta. Quería ver si usted wow. estaría dispuesto a participar. Que le hicieron una pequeña entrevista. Sí, con gusto. Eh, me interesaría saber. Sí, yo también tengo estudiantes. Sí. Sé lo que es esto. Su perspectiva acerca de cómo se está integrando a nivel institucional eh, los temas de género. Sí, fíjate que yo trabajé eso de género y agua. Sí, y en agricultura. También. Yo trabajé con usuarios de riego. Excelente, me gustaría, le voy a pasar un correo y sí, vemos, eh, a ver si podemos coordinar un poco para, para platicar. Le agradezco muchísimo. No, a ti, mucho. a ti. Oye, un gusto. Una de las No, no, ¿de qué? ¿De qué? Una pregunta, yo me quedé con una pregunta ahí en el tintero. Sí. Era este, el rol un poco de los consejos de cuenta y los comités de cuenta. Sí, fíjate que está bien la idea pero hay que cortarle el ombligo a esos conceptos de cuenta. O sea, depende de con agua. De con agua. O sea, ¿Por qué? Justo mi solo se reúnen a... cuando necesitan con agua. Deben ser autoprescriptos. Justo mi pregunta es que no fue en la articulación de los demás sectores. Porque en Perú... No, falta falta sí, ¿no? establecer eso. Y hay que buscar los mecanismos de cómo hacer los autoprescriptos. Porque nada más... Que con agua no tienes con agua. Con agua es que casi casi no se... No toman decisiones. Hay que reestructurar con eso. El problema es que las colonias son públicas. O sea, pasar agua de una cuenta sí, a otra. Sí. No, hombre, eso es complicado. Es ahí donde debe de intervenir. Pero, por supuesto, que está agua de esta cuenta. Que aquellos tratan, empiezan a cambiar las condiciones y los hijos para que los tengan su agua. O sea, tiene que ser más proactivo. Sí. Sí. Todos están acostumbrados cosa, de arriba a abajo claro. y, y otra lo que cosa, tiene que hacer es no, cambiar el dinámico claro, por abajo hacia de arriba. De abajo hacia arriba. Pero, y además la escala. La escala es muy importante. Sí, sí. Grandes cuencas sí. solo te permiten los consejos hacer planificación. Pero si tú quieres hacer gestión, intervención, tienes que hacerlo a nivel local. Entonces, y eso me dio comentar. Sí. Yo formé comités de, 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 de micro cuencas. Más chiquitos que la micro cuenta, y también la no cuenta. O sea, más chiquitos todavía. Ay, si, si tú quieres hacer acciones a nivel local, debes de ser sí, totalmente un pequeño de cara a cara que son los que tienen Yo los que, lo que hice, los juntos, todos los que compartían esa cuenta entre sí. las comunidades y los enseñaron. ¿Y se articulan con el consejo? Sí, claro. Entonces tú puedes hacer acciones a nivel local y ya luego de ahí creces horizontalmente. La única forma de que, la, de que la gente realmente se comprometa es que tenga un problema concreto que resolver. Porque, si tú, Porque a macro, a nivel a macro, nivel, no se ve, los no convoco casi no todos, pero van si como tú, a tomar el té. Si tú, por ejemplo, Así es. Claro, Así es. Si tú, por ejemplo, promueves sí. un programa de reforestación de una gran cuenca, nunca vas a ver el efecto. Pero si tú lo haces en una micro cuenca, ya de ahí al otro, te corres al otro y ahí sí lo ves. Ese ha sido el gran problema. Hay que entender que a nivel grande se planifica, pero se ejecuta a nivel local. De esto te quiero comentar y hablar. Oh. De, de, de la cuenta de Shulka. ¿No tienes tus notas, Porque yo no traje mis notas. Yo tengo cuenta. Vas al almuerzo. Vas al almuerzo. Sí, sí. Tienes que ir a hacer. Vamos, vamos. Vamos, vamos. Una, 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 una mesa reservada porque pero yo no tengo rango ninguno. Vamos, vamos. Pero soy la directora de universidad.
project when I was here. I just heard on Monday.
Paco, pero no me sé, no me vuelvo a hablar, pará. Right. Sounds like we're having some, some good conversations. Nice full room. I hope, um, I know we ran a little low on the food, so we're getting some more, more sandwiches. So if anyone did not get food, um, it'll be coming in a, in a little bit. Okay, some additional sandwiches will be coming shortly if you did not manage to get a sandwich. So we, we're going to go on to our um, discussion over lunch, and we have a colleague, John Furlow, who is going to be joining us uh, with some of his thoughts and, and comments. John is a senior climate change specialist at USAID. He's currently on detail at st the U.S. State Department, where he's helping to establish a national adaptation planning global network. He'll be talking a little bit more about this network. And as we have been rolling out these activities in the region, we have been collaborating and coordinating with John and some of his work in the region. So he's been very much a partner with us in these efforts. So I'll hand it over to, to John. And um, I apologize for stopping the conversation and for uh, interrupting your lunch. I will endeavor to make it uh, with your time. If it's not, you can just go back to talking. <laughs> um, let's see. So I'm going to talk about, let me go back. Um, I'm going to talk about, I've been working on national adaptation plans, the national adaptation planning process. Um, and I. I have been very encouraged in my work on NAPS <coughs> um, with a number of different developing countries that when, when we've talked about resilience, we talk about pulling from different threads of the development portfolio and not taking a single issue approach, but understanding that poverty and health and food security and agriculture, water management, et cetera, all play together in creating this sort of difficult to define thing that is development and uh, robust society and so forth. And <clears throat> having worked at AID for a while, we, this is not a secret, I don't think, we are structured to deal with things, oh, yeah. Um, AID and most development agencies are still structured to deal with things one issue at a time. And we create these cross-cutting uh, work streams to try to bring people together and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Roger Mark mentioned the resilience effort at AID, um, which has been a neat way of bridging the gap between the development and the humanitarian assistance budgets in a couple of places. <coughs> so when, when Roger Mark and I were talking about this, um, this workshop today, um, I started thinking about the work we've done with NAPS. And I'll come, I've been working on something called the NAP Global Network. Um, and I'll come to that at the end, but I'm going to start with a few remarks about uh, what are NAPs. Um, so what are they? They were, NAPs were conceived of at the Cancun COP, which was COP 16. <coughs> and this definition uh, came out of the Durban COP, which was 2011, I think, um, COP 17. <coughs> the objectives of national adaptation plans was to reduce vulnerability, 
and to do so by integrating uh, climate adaptation into other things we do. So what that means in shorthand to me is that we stop treating adaptation like a sector and start treating it as a stress or a risk that undermines the development sectors, the economic sectors, the social sectors that we care about. Um, and then the way to do that effectively is not to have an isolated adaptation strategy or an isolated plan, but to weave climate into the things that drive actual planning and decision making and investments. Um, when you start thinking that way, it sounds great. And then you think, okay, how do I get the agriculture minister to take on climate change? Climate is usually housed in the environment ministry. The environment ministry, I think this is not a secret either, the environment ministry is usually not the strongest ministry in most governments. So how do you get the little environment minister, oh thank you, the, the relatively weak environment ministry to get the big powerful ministries, finance, planning, agriculture, transport, energy, tourism, um, to think about climate change when we've all sort of been indoctrinated that climate is an environment thing. Um, so when you talk to some of these ministers and high level folks in governments responsible for things like agricultural productivity or uh, health, education, whatever, you raise climate and say, oh, well, that's, that's those guys. That's the environment ministry. Um, so how do you break down this barrier between the weak ministries that know the issue and the strong ministries that make the decisions and drive the budgets, et cetera. Um, so really, how do you create ownership so that the powerful ministries and the people that lead them feel like climate is their issue and not somebody else's? Um, at a NAP Global Network event a few weeks ago, um, we pulled these degrees of political support um, from the health sector. There's expressed commitment where people say, yeah, I'm with you. I think climate is important and I will try to do something about it. That's great, that's a good start. Um, doesn't necessarily lead to change. And there's institutional commitment. You begin putting policies in place. Um, you begin creating the, the institutional structures to deal with the issue. And then most of all, most important of all and or, or equally important and sort of the, the glue that holds the first two together is a budgetary commitment. Um, things can start to happen when there's funding for it. Um, and if you have the express commitment and the institutional commitment, but you don't have the budgetary commitment, you don't have much. Um, here's a good example of express commitment from some work that we did um, in Jamaica. The Minister of Finance, we had a big workshop with about 100, we started with about 150 people from across the government and civil society in Jamaica. Um, and I'm gonna come to that in a minute, but at the end, I was standing in the back of the room before our final session. Somebody walked up next to me and we had a word, a, a word map, a wordle thing up with some of the stuff that we had discussed during the two-day workshop. And it had you know, water, agriculture, um, tourism, other things up there. Things that the participants had identified as very important for Jamaica's development and things that were at risk of climate impacts. And this person who walked up next to me said, all right, I get that. And uh, I turned and it was the Minister of Finance. And I said, oh, <coughs> sir, I'm really glad that you came to this workshop. It was really important to have you there, here. Your presence really gave the stamp of authority to the, to the event. Um, and he said, you know, when you invited me, I wanted to know why do you want me? This is Pickersgill, the Minister of Environment. This is his thing. I don't need to be there. What am I gonna say? And then he said, now that I've sat through this for two days, I want to know why somebody didn't talk to me about this 20 years ago, because this is clearly my issue as the Minister of Finance as much as it is the Environment Minister's. Um, and he has continued talking this way. I checked with a colleague in the Climate Change Department and he said, oh yeah, um, Phillips talks about it as much as the, as the Environment Minister. So the Prime Minister of Jamaica asked aid to help, aid, uh, Jamaica had six or seven different national climate policies that were in different stages of development and none of them was done. And so none of them were really being implemented because they were all sort of done. Um, 
and the, the Prime Minister had created a new climate change, well, she created the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment, and Climate. Um, she created a climate change department. And um, we had been talking with some in that ministry about the confusion among other elements of the government about what is that ministry's role vis-a-vis um, -vis the planning department, which used to be in charge of climate. And um, in the water authority, the ag ministry, et cetera, nobody knew who to respond to about climate. And so they were just kind of letting it go. Um, so the prime minister asked the head of AID in Jamaica if aid would help Jamaica develop a new um, climate policy. We said yes. We decided that as our starting point that we wanted to be able to mainstream climate into the things that Jamaica does rather than creating a separate uh, climate policy that would be owned by the environment minister, ministry and perhaps ignored by finance, ag, uh, et cetera. So we started with the Jamaica um, the Vision 2030, which came out, I believe, in 2008, maybe 2010. It's a national, uh, <coughs> national development <coughs> plan. It survived two elections and changes of party. Um, so it's, it's now a part of the fabric of what Jamaica does. And it, you probably can't see it, but some of the things that um, Sandeep was talking about in terms of population dynamics are a part of it. A healthy and national outcomes are on the right. A healthy and stable population, effective social protection, world-class education. The things that to me look like classic economic sectors, which is where the government wanted to focus, are down there in part three. We have agriculture, manufacturing, mining, um, construction, et cetera. Down here, number 14 is hazard risk reduction and, ad and an adaptation to climate change. So when we talk to people about how are you dealing with climate as you implement the vision, they said, oh, well, that's subjective 14. It's, it's the environment ministry's issue. And there was not a clear way to get it from here up across these other places. So we called this big workshop, like I mentioned earlier, and we took the vision apart. We took the, the economic components apart. Um, and this was something that, that uh, my team and I developed at AID. And we wanted to put adaptation, treat it as a stress that would undermine development outcomes. We wanted to start with development objectives. So we took the vision and we took it apart and said, okay, what are the development objectives in the vision? What does it take to create internationally competitive agriculture or a robust tourism sector or whatever? Um, what, are the, what are the physical inputs? What are the um, policy conditions, the economic conditions that you need to support that? And then what are the risks and impediments to those things? Where is there going to be a climate disruption? And where are there other problems that are not climate? And this is where the idea of resilience comes in because we wanted to make sure that people were considering the multiple impediments that would undermine um, achieving development goals. And then uh, down there at the bottom is thinking about solutions. This would be an iterative process. You wouldn't do all of this. You wouldn't identify all solutions in a two-day workshop, but you would get people thinking and then go back um, in more and more detail as you identify priorities up there at the top. Um, this is what it looked like when we did it. Uh, again, it may be a little hard to see, but this is a flip chart. Um, we put agriculture, one of the sectors that was in the vision here. Um, we had tables of about eight or ten people taking the, the vision priorities apart and doing what I showed in the previous one. These are the inputs. Um, we had mixed, those 10 people were not all from the ag ministry. They were from across different sectors. Um, this woman who led this session was from the opposition party and she was a health expert, but she was at the ag table. Um, this is what it looked like up close. They, one of the key inputs for ag achieving agricultural out comes is uh, a robust crop and livestock sector, and you can well, you probably can't see um, stress is arrayed around it. The red ones are uh, climate related, the, the black ones are non-climate. This is it a little bit more formal. Again, you can see the energy, water, and crops, livestock, and fisheries were identified as physical inputs. Um, access to credit and finance, 
and a legal and regulatory framework were identified as enabling conditions. Then we took, we took each of those and broke them down further and we said, okay, what can you do <coughs> to resolve the climate stresses that we've talked about and who's responsible? And we kept seeing the, um, <coughs> the uh, Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate come up as a key actor in this and they were one that three or four months earlier, people said they some some of the folks in the other agencies weren't aware that it fully existed. Um, they didn't know how to access them, but they were able to say that they would be important, and particularly important was the Met Service, um, the National Weather Service who provided information. Um, so Jamaica is hopefully almost done with a national policy um, that it's not a single policy. They created an adaptation and mitigation policy framework that charges each of the, the economic, each of the ministries re responsible for the key components of the vision with developing an action plan that would address climate risks and opportunities for reducing emissions. Um, they have identified 26 focal points uh, across the government. And so now the responsibility is sh shared across the government. It's not just the minister or the ministry. And we had a bit of a debate with the minister over what it would mean to put responsibility, whether he held responsibility or pushed it out to some of the other ministers. And uh, he eventually agreed that he would not have any authority over the energy ministry, for example, um, to get them to implement his priorities. So he was willing to share. Um, so then, uh, with those 26 focal points, we began working with the Wilson Center and we did a training for them. We took the same basic approach, but we asked the, the key focal points, or the 26 focal points, <coughs> what's your ministry's mission statement? What are you responsible for as a representative of these mi ministries or agencies? What's success for you? Um, who depends on you? So if you're an ag extension, farmers depend on you. Who do you depend on? The Met Service, Ag Research, um, the General Ministry, et cetera. What, what inputs and conditions do you need? You need a budget, you need computers, you need trucks, you need gasoline, et cetera. What do you need? What constitutes, what are the inputs you need to succeed? And then again, what are the risks and impediments? Um, so we wanted them to start thinking about the idea here of who do you depend on and who depends on you was to start putting together multi-sectoral teams so that they could write these sectoral adaptation plans with the right people at the table. And we were doing that exercise in Kingston in 2012 that the minister was at. Uh, a colleague of mine and I were both floating around checking to make sure that the conversation was moving and he went to the, he went to the tourism table and they had a great array of the sticky charts, sticky notes like I showed you. Um, and he said, hey, there's nothing there about transportation. How do the tourists get to the hotels? And they said, oh, we've got a good coastal road network. We're not worried about that. And he said, okay. And he walked over to the transportation table and they were deciding that the best thing they could do was to stop investing in coastal road maintenance as the roads degraded and got destroyed, they would rebuild them inland where they wouldn't have to rebuild them every hurricane season. So Mike walked back to the tourism table and said, hey, you know what? That road network that you have not addressed in your list of key inputs, they're getting rid of it over there. <laughs> so somebody stood up and walked over and they've begun talking and now tourism is being, in, sorry, transport is being engaged in tourism. Um, on an earlier trip down there when we were setting up the workshop, um, I was the one who broke the news to the head of the tourism department that the Ministry of Energy had gotten a permit for a coal-fired power plant in a protected area. And the head of tourism pulled out a poster that they had just gotten printed that was showing, it was promoting uh, inland tourism. They're trying to move the tourists away from the coast in the protected area where the coal-fired power plant had just been approved to be built. And she said, Nobody wants to go hiking near a power plant. What, we told them we needed energy, but not this. So they're, they're starting to talk. Um, this is what Jamaica's doing. Um, they've got, they're, they're developing 12 of these sector work plans that address mitigation and adaptation. 
Um, those sector work plans are meant to feed into the, um, I think it's five year and three year medium and short term work plans to implement the vision. Um, already underway are the forestry plan, the agriculture plan, and there was a workshop last week or the week before in Jamaica on climate smart ag and fisheries. Um, USAID is supporting forestry and agriculture. The five C's, the Carib Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, thank you, um, is supporting the fisheries one with EU support, EU funding. <coughs> and then the ones that will come up over the next couple of years are um, trans, well, you can read them. Uh, and they're, they're being supported by different donors, but the donors and the the Ministry of the Climate Department um, are setting up sort of standard operating procedures so that the, you know, a PPCR funded plan will be comparable in appearance and in understandability to one that's supported by AID or the EU. Um, so now to the NAP Global Network. This was, um, like I said, we started this, uh, maybe I didn't say this. Um, this was launched at the Lima COP last December. Um, and the idea was that as NAPs take off, a number of, well, most developing countries are beginning to work on these. There's no defined template for a national adaptation plan the way there was for a national adaptation plan of action in NAPA. And in some of the meetings I've been at, there's like a discomfort with some of the dis developing countries that it's not clear what their NAP should look like or when it's going to be done um, or what they have to do with it. And so, and the NAPAs were largely led by multilaterals and we realized um, the U.S. talking with Germany and Japan and Britain and other donors that have big bilateral agencies as well, <coughs> realized that we're all working on these. We're trying to, each of the bilateral donors, AID and GIZ and DFID and JICA, et cetera, are trying to figure out how we provide support, how we coordinate with each, others, each other. Um, so Doritza's comment about the lack of coordination. I was in the Caribbean earlier this year um, for one of these meetings trying to encourage coordination. Um, we found that USAID and DFID were both supporting a beach replenishment project on the same beach and didn't know it, and we had been working there for several years. And the government of this country was also still issuing sand mining licenses for the same beach. Um, so often the, the coordination barrier is not that high. It's just getting the right three people in the room together to say, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening and we didn't know it. Um, so the idea was that we could share lessons among the donors. We could also enable, Jamaica has great experience with this. Um, they are to a degree out in front of other developing countries. The Philippines has done a fantastic job and is way out front. Um, so we also wanted to enable countries to learn from each other. Um, and we wanted to also make sure that, to do a better job about making sure that uh, our field offices, the bilateral donor field offices, know something about NAPs, know that they're important diplomatically to the U.S., to Germany, et cetera, to the whole world, really. They're a keystone piece of the adaptation negotiations. Um, and so we pulled together in this network, um, and it's going to be rolling out over the next two or three years. We had our first what we call targeted topic forum um, at the beginning of July. The topic was building political support for NAPs and then helping people figure out how to write these integrated or, or mainstream sector plans. Um, we had about 10 countries. Um, we tried to get everybody to bring teams of three. Uh, somebody, the climate focal point, but also a sector lead and somebody from the finance or planning department. So we would have the climate expertise, the, the, the sector that we wanted to influence, and then the money um, and the sort of national support. We also tried to bring in people from the donor agencies so that we would be aware of what the countries are trying to achieve so that our work could better support it. Um, I will stop there and you can either finish your lunch or ask questions or whatever you'd like.
Thank you for your time. I've done some research on the Napa's in sub-Saharan African countries, and overwhelmingly, gender is not included or integrated. It's kind of an afterthought. Um, I'm wondering if USAID is targeting um, inclusion or integration of gender issues in the Naps. Thank you. We're doing a better job than we were a few years ago on <laughs> addressing gender issues across everything the agency does. Um, we are not supporting NAPs explicitly that much yet. We're hoping through this net, well the network's gone, but um, through the network to do more. Um, we're seeing that aid missions are kind of on a five year uh, planning and, and planning cycle and NAPs have kind of come up in a lot of cases in the middle of that. but. Um, Addressing gender issues is an explicit part of the UNFCCC language on NAPS. In the conversations that I've been in, um, you know, in the, in the targeted topic forum in Rio at the beginning of July and in the work we've done in Jamaica, my colleague John has been involved as well. Um, we're trying to figure out how to bring it in in an effective way. Um, and then outside of this, aid has done some work in West Africa looking at, um, in particular, how gender differences and other differences um, affect the uptake of information that's targeted at farmers. But that's outside the NAP process. Hopefully it will someday become a part of a NAP process. <coughs> but um, that was just some research that we were doing. Is I'll I'll type it. Oh, you, well, you can you could probably just um, I'll type it in. Well, maybe I won't. <laughs> um, it's napglobalnetwork.org, and I think if you Google it, uh, hopefully you'll be able to find it. It's a new website. Um, it seems like each time I look at it, it's changed a little bit. Um, and the Secretariat is run by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, which is also the group that puts out the, um, the Climate L listserv, I think. You talk about um, cooperation between different organizations and initiatives in Lima. Uh, JUNEP launched this um, Lima Adaptation Knowledge Initiative that was part of this global adaptation network, GAN, mm -hmm. um, that they are promoting to fill the knowledge gap in the adaptation processes. I don't know how link, uh, how linked are bo both initiatives. We've been talking with the GAN about um, how we might fit in, and we've been talking with a lot of people about how we don't hopefully overlap too much with the GAN or the NAP Global Support Program, which is a UNDP, UNEP effort. Um, so we've been talking with the leadership of the GAN, uh, I, and hopefully I think they're going to have some planning meetings this fall, and we're hoping that we can provide some input. We participated, our network participated in an event that they had uh, in Bonn in June at the subsidiary body meetings. So we're beginning to talk and kind of work out how these things complement but don't duplicate each other. Roger Mark. So John, if I can ask you a question, I hope it's a, a fair question, not directly related to what you've presented. But could you talk a little bit about how you see the body of work that we have been talking about today featuring in Paris? And what do you hope will come out of Paris and post Paris? Any thoughts in in that area? Um, 
I don't negotiate. <laughs> Thank goodness, for me anyway. Um, so I need to be careful about what I say because it has no weight because I'm not a negotiator. Um, I think that if some of what has been presented today can be captured in Paris in some events, side events, um, it would be great because often the last time I was in the negotiating room I think was in Warsaw. And it often feels like um, the, there's, it's almost like a despairing sense um, that you know, there's not enough going on, nothing good is going on. And yet when you walk outside, there's great stuff being, go being done. Um, it may not be enough, but it's not that we're at ground zero. Um, we've made a lot of progress over the years. The thinking about how to address climate has really evolved over the years. And so I think that if some of these lessons can be communicated, um, particularly through side events, uh, where you can really share with other people who are working on similar issues and they might pick up what you're doing and apply it somewhere else, that would be fantastic. Um, unfortunately, the, the deadline for submitting UNFCCC side event proposals was July 3rd, I think. Um, but there are a number of other opportunities that you might be able to chime in. Um, I think it would be very important for uh, Peru, the DR, other countries that have been represented here or have been a part of these, this series of events that you've put on to make sure that their negotiators know what's been happening and that um, there are good activities taking place and that there are signs of hope. My name is Julio Guiti from Sudec Inc. Uh, if you could assess the level of effort of the progress that have been made in different regions or sub-regions, Latin America versus, I mean, uh, the Caribbean. We have very small islands in the Caribbean. <coughs> you make it's a good example because it's a good island, but if you, if you can tell us a little bit what needs to be done and what direction we should move in the adaptation side, but also in the mitigation side. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I want to make sure that I don't anger anybody in the region because I love going there. Um, <laughs> I don't want to find that I can't get through customs or something. Um, so I don't know about everything that's going on. I don't know about the sort of northern part of the Caribbean. Most of my work has been either in Jamaica or um, AID has a regional office based in Barbados serving the basically the OECS, the Organization for East Caribbean States. Um, and I, I think part of the issue, so Jamaica may be a little bit ahead of some of the others, sort of you think of them all following the same timeline. Jamaica in 2012 had seven or eight climate policies, I think, that were in various states of completion with different people responsible for them. And the Prime Minister kind of said, enough. Let's get one, let's finish it, and let's live with it. Um, I was talking to a negotiator from St. Lucia in Bonn in June, and he said that they have a number of plans that, you know, they have adaptation plans, they have ag plans, they have water plans, they have tourism plans. And what they'd really like to do is just fit them all together and make sure that they adequately address climate risk, but not just climate risk, that they take this integrated approach. Um, Grenada uh, is, has started their, their NAP process with GIZ, but I think that they're hoping very quickly, they're also starting a national development plan, something comparable to the vision, uh, the Jamaica vision. So I think that Grenada is hoping very quickly to shift from having a separate plan to just weaving adaptation into the development plan. Um, the thing that I hope countries are beginning to realize is that the, the flexibility that's offered by the very vague or somewhat vague language 
that the cop has come out with was meant to be an asset so that nobody has to go back and create a plan that they already have but in different forms. So the one of the key messages is whatever adaptation planning you take on needs to serve your purposes. It doesn't need to serve, there's no, you're not gonna get it wrong um, because there's no definition of what's right. So if, if where are you from? Honduras. Okay, so Honduras. Um, if you have the elements that could be cobbled together into a, an adaptation plan um, that would help your development, do that. Don't go back and follow the pattern laid out by the NAPA, unless that's what Honduras needs to do. And what was really interesting at the, the workshop I was at in Brazil, um, we had a, a representative from Bolivia and we had talked before he came, and he said, yeah, I've got to get going on the NAP, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna persuade all of the other powerful ministries, the topic of the workshop. And then when he got there, we were talking about how that was gonna go, and he said, you know what? I just found out that we're about to release a national development plan, and we're already putting adaptation into it, so I don't have to do a separate adaptation plan. Some countries are doing uh, kind of a kind of like Jamaica, they're doing an umbrella adaptation plan that says we're going to address this through our normal uh, planning process with budgets attached. We're going to take all of that to the donor community and work with them to get pieces of it implemented. So do what works for you. Um, and it's funny in, <coughs> in talking to countries, it'll feel like someone's way out front or way behind, but then they'll do their own little stock taking, like Bolivia did, and say, oh. We have 95% of it here. We just need to make sure that the right people and the right sentences are in the document, the right people know about it, and then let's put our energy into acting on it. So my advice would be don't feel like there's a set template that you have to abide by. Do what's best for you or your country um, that serves the purposes that you hope for it and that pulls on what you've already done so you don't do any extra work. Yeah, the short answer is no, I can't, I can't answer that. The longer answer, um, and you should check with, um, with the folks in EGC, not me, someone else. Um, including adaptation in INDCs is voluntary. Um, and so some countries are doing it, some aren't. Um, I think it, it may depend on where they are in this cycle of how far along is their is their adaptation planning vis-a-vis -vis their mitigation planning. Um, and so what they put in will vary from country to country. Thank you. 